You're listening to All Things Video, the podcast dedicated to uncovering the past and charting the future of the online video ecosystem. You're listening to All Things Video. I'm your host, James Creech, and today's guest is Tracy Benson, co-founder and CEO of Obsesh. Tracy, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks for having me, James. I'm so excited to be here today. Yeah, I'm excited to get to chat with you too. We've been uh, keeping in touch. Uh, amidst quarantine. You're up in San Francisco. I'm down here in LA, but always a pleasure to chat with you. And I'm excited to dive a little bit more into your background and then talk a bit about the adventure that is Obsesh. That sounds great. Yeah. Um, you know, first of all, I hope you're staying healthy and I hope all your followers and listeners are staying healthy. Yeah, likewise. Uh, we've just got our latest shutdown. So it's time to mask up and yep. prepare ourselves to help keep this world healthy. For sure. Lockdown. I'm to talk to you. Yeah, definitely for a, for a nice winter break. So, I, you know, you, you cut your teeth in the agency world before serving as the CMO for some of the world's biggest brands like Best Buy, Monster, and Seek Thermal. But before we get to all that, I actually thought maybe we'd travel back even further in time and talk about your career as a professional athlete playing beach volleyball. Oh, sure. That, uh, we'll, we'll say that's a long time ago sure. at this point. Um, it's about half my life ago. But yeah, I grew up as a athlete. That's all I thought about. Like most athletes, that's when you're into sports, you know, whether you're a fan or the actual athlete, that's, you know, that's what you think about 24 seven. So that was me. I grew up playing uh, both fast pitch softball and volleyball. I think anything that had a ball and I could chase it, slide after it, go for it, block it. That was my thing. And so I played uh, through college as a D1 athlete, uh, fortunate to have a full ride scholarship because I'm not even sure today if I could even afford to go. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know, I was fortunate to have everything paid for. And then coming out of college, I played a couple of years uh, on the beach circuit, which was down in Miami. Amazing. It was a different sport. Totally yeah, different. Bet. Going from indoor volleyball to the beach feels like you're, you've gone from like a really hard surface to quicksand. And how did you totally train for that? Game. I mean, what was that transition like? Yeah, the the training, I mean, you use your core volleyball skills, which you've honed and perfected by this point, you know, uh, for many, many years. But training on the beach is totally different because you just don't move as fast. You have two people instead of six. I'm not running an offense of five other people. Um, I have, you know, me plus one. And so it's a lot of court to cover. It's totally different trying to take off and jump and accelerate. And it it just, you know, I I suppose if there was a world where basketball players could go from five on a court to two on two, same kind of thing. You're Mm -hmm. all of a sudden you got a lot more to cover um, with a lot less people, but it was super fun. Yeah. What an awesome early experience. And then you kind of transition, make your way in the agency world. How did that come about? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. I actually had a pit stop before mm-hmm. that. And so I was playing volleyball and, uh, you know, like so many athletes, you get to a point where you've just struggled trying to make any kind of money. So I would work at night at Chili's for a couple hours, you know, at the restaurant. I would uh, work at this fish house. I would do anything whether it was like babysitting, teaching, you know, camps, summer camps, I was doing everything possible. And, you know, I finally had to get to the point where it was like, I couldn't afford my rent. I was already living with three people. It just, I needed a job. Um, along came uh, AT&T first. And at the time they hired a lot of athletes uh, mm-hmm. because I suppose our mindset is always give us a goal. We're going to go chase it. Mm-hmm. So I did that for a little bit and I ended up uh, through the course of that going to work for Home Depot. I lost a little bet uh, with somebody I didn't know at the time happened <laughs> to be the financial backer of Home Depot. Oh, wow. <laughs> and so I lost the bet. Uh, Went to go work for Home Depot, and it was a great ride for about five, six years, Uh uh, working under Arthur Blank, and I was building out Home Depot stores and markets, which uh, gave me, like, the real deal around what motivates employees, what motivates consumers, what turns them on, what turns them off, and after doing that for about 
five, six years developing hundreds of stores across so many markets. I then went and I knew I wanted to be a marketer, but I just didn't have the sort of skills. I mean, I was doing it every day, sure. certainly building markets. So I went into the agency world and I worked for uh, Razorfish mm -hmm. back before Microsoft acquired it. Mm -hmm. And it was like the start of the digital world. So it was super cool. It challenged my mind. It challenged, you know, everything we thought about consumers. And it cracked open this entirely new world of digital technology, which was just prior to actually YouTube coming about in 2005. So it was a fun time. It was yeah. like the Wild West, which is what it's like now. That's amazing. Yeah, it, you mentioned AT&T hired a lot of athletes. Home Depot also famously hires a lot of athletes. In, in fact, even the number of Olympians, I know they always mm -hmm. kind of uh, mention that, you know, every two to four years. So what a great yeah, foundational you know. experience getting to see the consumer, you know, uh, insights at the, at the store level and then also thinking about as a consumer, what do I want yeah. from a marketing strategy and then being able to move to the agency side and apply those principles. Exactly. And James, I got a fun fact for you, okay. um, which might just blow your mind. Yeah. So I started the Olympic work program at Home Depot. No way. That's and that incredible. came about because we had, I had lots of friends that were athletes. And in mm -hmm. particular, I had a very close friend. His name is Kent Ferguson. And he was an Olympic diver. And he was in an era with uh, Greg Luganis. And the problem was, Olympians were getting little stipends from the U.S. Olympic Committee, but they didn't have the flexibility or the time to have other jobs because their job is training 24-7. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I came out with this idea and proposed it to Arthur and was like, listen, if we can have these athletes work for us, there's nobody better than an athlete. I mean, look, you know, what we're accomplishing and but they need to make money and so home depot was really supportive and we crafted a program where if an olympic athlete worked 20 hours in the store we'd give them a flexible schedule and we'd pay them for 40 hours that was like amazing wow what an incredible any olympic initiative. athlete yeah and and home depot at the time um i don't know about now but at the time we gave part-time employees benefits so like healthcare and medical, and not many retailers did that, especially mm -hmm. for part-time employees. So as an Olympian, you know, their healthcare is not automatically covered. So sure. they have to have insurance. And so it was a super cool way to get athletes involved, get them working, get them paid, get my friends involved working and paid. And uh, it turned out to be a really awesome program that I hope Knock on something still exists for Home yeah, Depot today. That's terrific. I'm pretty sure it does. Yeah, very yeah. cool. So you go to Razorfish, and uh, you know what was what yeah. was that early experience like? What were you focused on in those days at Razorfish? <clears throat> oh my gosh! At that time, we were focused on. Uh, I don't know if you remember the first a uh, digital ad. I can't remember. It was like brilliant. It was like a uh, sky. It was a leaderboard ad, mm -hmm. and it was like if you push this, I can't remember who did it, but our focus was just really on bringing digital advertising to the new web world. So you started to have these <clears throat> e-commerce experiences that were maybe four pages deep, five pages deep. You know, it was like early days and we were focused on how do we get a brand presence on a page where a consumer has a total focus on these devices. And so it was kind of fun. It was, you know, we created standard boxes, couple sizes because, you know, we didn't have responsive web and we started doing some of these early advertising uh, units. And so those units, crazy enough, still exist today. They're still, you know, relatively same sizes. They've got these standards around them. Um, but it was really around digital advertising and starting mm -hmm. to measure, would somebody click? What got them a click? What brought them into that experience? No different than when, you know, you're in a store or any kind of retail environment, you've got a lot of distractions, but at the time there were fewer distractions around digital advertising. So when somebody saw that page, 
they were like, whoa, their mind was blown. Yeah. You know, I remember today, those days when we digital advertising was cons- so novel. Yeah. yeah. It was so novel and it was so cool. And I remember when it went from the standard unit, which was static, to all of a sudden something could move in that box. Mm-hmm. And it was like, whoa, holy shit, you know, <laughs> like this is going to change the world. Yeah. And then before sure you knew enough, it, people it were playing. It playing games on um, those digital ads. You were playing, you know, poker or you were, you know, yeah. then you went to, you know, social totally. gaming. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. So you spent it's, nine I mean, years. Oh, go when ahead. You look back. I was just going to say, when you look back, it seems like it was so long ago, but it was really only 15 years ago. Like think about how far we've come in 15 years. Mm -hmm. The first iPhone was 2007. YouTube was 2005 and Mm -hmm. we're at 2020. Let's, let's assume we use a, lose a year of good advertising from the pandemic here, but it wasn't that long ago. And we've just come every year. It just gets faster and the innovation faster and the technology faster. It's so cool. Such a great time to be a part of this for sure that's awesome so you spent nine years on the agency side and then uh yet another Mm -hmm. kind of career move you go in-house with a brand and you say okay i'm going to lead marketing and initially digital marketing and then kind of overall marketing for best buy how did that opportunity come about yeah well i I don't think i was on the agency side nine years but it certainly felt like (laughs) it felt like uh nine you know lifetimes uh at some point Um, So the agency side was really great because it was at a time where I brought a lot of expertise around retail um, and I understood consumer behaviors and patterns. And that was never really uh, possible in a digital medium at that point. And so everything was really about mass communications, right? Put a 30 second spot up on a TV, the whole family sitting around the living room, we're all gonna watch it and everybody's gonna get up and run to the store, you know, from that ad. And so in the early days of digital, what was really cool about the agency business was we were all learning together. Like, where's this going? What's working? What's not working? And data and analytics uh, really was much easier back then because you only had a couple couple different units. You're measuring a smaller amount of traffic versus today. It's attributions like all over the place still a hairball Mm -hmm. um but those early days on the agency side we were help on you know it was about onboarding uh verticals so like i was focused on the retail vertical so you know i was working with companies like jc penny to build their e-commerce site their digital strategy and then you know move consumers who used to look at the catalog to look online right and the catalog online was literally like six pages deep and the guy who was the head of jcp.com would you know every morning push the cpu underneath his desk to reset it (laughs) well so that kind of grew and evolved and you know i got to be a big part of really taking brands like victoria's secret to a whole new level with pink that was pretty like engaging and interactive or taking companies like you know lion's end or you know, Home Depot, et cetera, to new levels in the e-commerce space. But then I always knew because I related to wanting to drive the strategies. I always knew I was going to go back on the brand side and uh, because I like to, you know, be able to shape the whole thing, not just a piece of it. And I understood the kind of big picture and wanted to be a part of uh, leading that. And so after some time there, I intentionally waited um, to move over back to the brand side because there was a point in time where if you knew anything about e-commerce, you were gonna just spend your life pushing pixels. And I didn't wanna do that. I want, I envisioned a world where marketing was being driven by a new consumer technology in the digital space. And so I waited and then Best Buy had recruited me they recruited me to come over and run uh, and build their digital capabilities, which was across advertising, marketing, their mobile commerce, as well as, you know, the core uh, marketing capabilities and functions like reward 
you know, and loyalty, consumer relationships, merchandising in store, online. So I went, I took the opportunity because here's this great big, you know, retailer, $50 billion brand who sells the world's technology. And I just wanted to be a part of that and help shape that. So I went over and did that. Fantastic. And yeah. you've obviously observed retail change pretty fundamentally in the last, call it 15, 20 years. What yeah. are the biggest changes and, and who did a good job of getting ahead of the digital curve and jumping in and saying, okay, we're going to revolutionize the way we do things. Um, you know, do you have any examples that you can share? Yeah, sure. I mean, the wonderful thing about, especially in being at Best Buy, you know, you work with hundreds of product manufacturers, good, bad, new, old, you know, changing, mm -hmm. disrupting, innovating. And, you know, I think some of the biggest movements were when brands who were born online didn't have a retail footprint, they were forced to think as a store, but as an online store. That was the only door they had versus, so you take like Amazon. Amazon was born and bred online, right? No physical stores. Whereas Best Buy was, you know, 98% of the business forever was done in the physical stores. The mindset and the thinking was just in the innovation completely different. Best Buy thought about how do we get footfall traffic into the store and then the evolution was how do we get them to make their decisions online but still come into the store and then the evolution was maybe they don't want to come in the store let's just get them to buy online mm -hmm. and then the next evolution was well it doesn't matter if they're in the store we could see consumers standing at the aisle looking at say uh, you know, Samsung's phone or, you know, Beats headphones, and they'd be researching and trying to look at those decisions and those barriers while they're standing in the store. Mm -hmm. And so the evolution to what we call omnichannel is really about like any device, anytime it intersects everything in everybody's life. And today you're seeing that with TV. We still haven't quite got TV to be fully interactive, although most people, I would think probably half of the U.S. at least, owns interactive, you know, web-based TVs. Um, but you still have, you know, 80 million people that have rabbit ears on the top of the roof. So on the flip side, you know, I think seeing companies like Amazon, I can remember when Amazon was really small, Best Buy was really big. And it was like, ah, you know, we don't need to worry about that. And then all of a sudden you see their mindset's different. The way they're pushing, you know, pixels and purpose and pages is different. The way they're, you, you know, giving consumers utility and the ability to do reviews and ratings, all those things really helped shape that. And when you look at some of the smaller brands, I think, uh, you know, you take somebody like, Fitbit or Strava, where you're starting to intersect, you know, data, consumer communities, and commerce. And what's come full circle is really interesting that there was a period where everybody, you know, hypothesized, you don't need stores. Why do we need stores? We got online. Mm -hmm. Like just everything will go online. But I think what we've seen in the shift is that stores play a role they might not play the role of the sole source of information and buying, but they play a role in what consumers touch and experience. And you need that because right now we're living in a world where everything is online and how much do we crave and beg to actually go somewhere and feel the chair, feel the cocktail, mm -hmm. taste the cup. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like you want that textile experience. And so the evolution I think has been, there, there's a role for mobile, online, and in-store, and you're even now seeing Amazon creating stores. Mm -hmm. That's right? right. And so, you know, whether it's direct to consumer or it's multi-channel retail, I think there's a role for everything. It's just finding what is that balance by brand, because brand by brand is totally different. So a great example, Beats, you know, and a lot of players have done this since then, 
is you set up a shop where you can go in and experience a product, but you can't buy it there because mm. we're not holding it there. Mm-hmm. You just buy it online. And those, those stores play a huge role. Sometimes they're the biggest influence because somebody can go touch it. Yeah. So it's such a cool time. Yeah. That reminds me of, you know, Tesla's approach to auto sales, right? Why do we need, hey, yeah. these huge dealerships and these fleets of cars and instant <clears throat> selection where you're going to drive off a lot? No, we're going to give you an experience about the product and the brand identity. That's you go right. away, you think That's about what right. you order it, and then we bring it to you. So it's fundamentally just changing the model. Yeah. And you, you've probably seen as well as I have is all of a sudden in markets where they've identified this is a potentially a Tesla market, instead of having a store, you know, they're parking seven Teslas right Mm -hmm. outside of, you know, this restaurant or this hotel. Mm -hmm. It's it's, to your point, people, people need to experience a, a certain type of product. There's things that are just utility in your life. We saw this with the iPhone. I was at Best Buy when the iPhone was just starting, you know, iPhone generation one. Wow. And people had to come in and they had to like touch the phone, feel it, see it. And I don't know if you remember this. I'm totally dating myself, even though it was only whatever, 13 years ago. (laughs) Um, You couldn't get email on the iPhone. That's right. You could not get email, right? Mm -hmm. So we all had our Blackberries, but we were like playing (laughs) with our new iPhone. Yeah, yeah. And when you see that evolution of the products, you know, now if I'm going to buy an iPhone, I really don't need to go see it and feel it. Mm -hmm. I've had six. You know what to expect. Yeah. I know. The camera's better. The battery's better. better. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so usually consumers, when they're purchasing something for the first time, if it's a, uh, a want Mm -hmm. versus a need, right? It's a want. Like, I want a new bed. I want a new webcam. It helps to be able to see it and experience it and feel it. And so, but once you've had five webcams and we're in this environment, we're like, okay, just, you know, I can order it online. It becomes more utility. Yeah. And yeah, so yeah. it's a, it's a really interesting time and COVID is cracking open a new wedge that I think will likely spur a lot more innovation because the world was heading this way, but now all of a sudden we've all been forced to be online, uh, Uh which is going to, you know, create a whole new window of opportunity for new companies, new ways to consume all by, you know, online. Who would have thought we'd all be using Zoom for God's sake? Right, exactly. (laughs) No, I think you hit the nail on the head that, you know, what Amazon did to retail is say, okay, this is the place to start for discovery, right? I don't know how many, um, you know, purchase decisions, purchase intent begins with Amazon now, especially for Prime members. It's like, that's in your mind, the go-to destination. Uh, And, you know, the other thing that the internet has brought is, which is maybe the, the foil to what Amazon has built is something like Shopify, which has said, the power of the internet is that it's democratized access to finding your audience. You don't need a a physical store necessarily if you're a small e-commerce brand direct to consumer, launch your Mm -hmm. business on Shopify, build your audience, do email marketing Mm -hmm. campaigns, leverage influencers, and then sell your product, right? And Shopify has all of the the infrastructure that you need to to do that today. Yeah, you know, that plug and play, plug and play model. um, I remember when Shopify was starting and I can almost, to this day, remember I was sitting in an airport traveling. I was at Best Buy, meaning working for Best Buy. And I got this call from somebody who knew somebody that wanted to know if I wanted to invest in Shopify. And I was like, what is this? Oh, an e-commerce player that's going to what? Democratize access? Uh No way. It's never going to happen. That was my, that's what I said. No way. Yeah never going to happen. Uh-huh. I said, you know, if Amazon doesn't eat their shirts first, Best mm-hmm. Buy will. And yep. I mean, look at where we're at today. Sure. You know, that's my biggest regret. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Sitting at that airport, making a quick decision. You I'll know, never forget one um, of my first bosses right yeah. out of college said uh, when he first heard about Amazon, he was like, oh, people will never buy books on the internet. Right. Oh, so yeah. it, it's so easy to get, to get caught in the current version of, okay, this is how the world works. This is how things are. And it's hard to yeah. predict how those things will fundamentally disrupt. But I think what's maybe most exciting about retail of the future is you look at 
you know, what's the impact of say AR or VR going to be? We don't need mm. these big warehouse mm. store environments anymore, unless it's maybe a Home Depot or whatever, a Costco. Yeah. But you go to yeah. something like Nordstrom, like how will the department store change? Yeah. Well, maybe they don't have, you know, something in every size. They'll have, you know, three sizes and yeah. you can get the experience. You can touch the product and then you select yeah. your size and they ship it to you. Right. Absolutely. So, I think you're bringing up a really good point. Kind of that wedge I was talking about. This is going to force that innovation to come about because we're already familiar with a certain level of online buying. We think it's, you know, whatever we want, but really people st still aren't like in the mass buying mm. houses online. They're not, yeah. you know what I mean? It's still pretty niche. Sure. Um, but this, this new world, I think what you bring up, you know, AR and VR, in particular VR, if I just imagine if you could give somebody the experience of being at a store, mm -hmm. you know, like maybe you're in New York at, you know, Saks Fifth Avenue, right? Like I can't yeah. shop there being in LA, but now all of a sudden yeah. you're the power of VR, you can't. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, and same thing for events, the events that we all used to go to, you know, mm -hmm. the Coachella's, the South by Southwest, you name it, yeah. any kind of event from Sasquatch to Coachella. Mm -hmm. If you can't be there, but all of a sudden you can use virtual reality to feel like you're there and feel like, like, hey, James, you want to meet me at South by Southwest? Let's yeah. put on our, you know, Oculus and go. Uh -huh. I think it's going to, it's going to be interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very cool. Which is a kind of a, it's a fun time. Again, you know, you take something that's so difficult for people and so meaningful, those relationships and those connections. And I think in some ways we haven't been using technology in the way that it's best meant to be used because we haven't been forced to find that best fit. And I think VR is one of those things where, you know, I've been seeing it sold as entertainment, mm -hmm. but I can remember 3D TVs did not sell. Yeah. Like that crashed as fast as we put them up in the stores. But I think if virtual could somehow help people feel like they're part of a classroom at school, mm -hmm. kids, or could help them feel like they went to an event or a festival. Imagine if we had that now. See each other. Yeah. Yeah. We would, you know, but so I think it's going to be a pretty interesting time, in particular for VR, mm -hmm. to see if some new innovators kind of rise to the cream of the crop during this window of time to. Yeah to help us reshape our own thinking. I hope so, yeah. So I wanna fast forward a little bit and get to your entrepreneurial journey, right? <laughs> so you spent a number of years, yeah. first at Best Buy, then Monster with the headphones and Seek Thermal as a CMO for these global <laughs> brands, accomplished some incredible yeah. things, and then decide you know, in 2017, hey, I'm gonna co-found this production studio called Be Alive, which is focused on outdoor content, branded entertainment. So I'm curious, you know, yeah. what, what said, hey, I'm gonna take the entrepreneurial leap. What was it that uh, inspired that first business? Well, the first business was really born out of uh, what is now Obsesh, mm -hmm. um, which is a real-time sports platform. But the first business was, was, it came about because I continue to see talent in the industry struggle to try and make money. They just didn't, you know, the sport, in particular, the sports ecosystem did not, uh, it wasn't built for the individual. It was built for the teams, leagues, and brands to fill the seats in, you know, the stadiums, to sell the merch, you know, buy the hot dogs, do the whole thing. And so when uh, I started out on that journey, I really wanted to uh, partner with some people who could get behind the mission. What I realized was the importance and the relevance of experience in the digital space is really important for today's, you know, to be effective. And I had always envisioned a online platform that would connect two sides of the market and make it easy. Um, but that just wasn't the direction that, you know, my co-founders uh, in Be Alive wanted to go. And so, you know, the greatest blessing about a lot of experience is knowing, you know, when to stay in your passion, when to, uh, you know, take a right turn and get back to your vision and your mission. And so that's what I did and hit the reset button, launched what is called Obsesh. And 
that's where you know we're growing today and we have a lot of uh, early success a lot of evidence that it's the right time to build a marketplace connecting athletes and consumers and making it easy for them to come together and experience you know skills and training and tips and techniques because we want to transform the way fans get access to the people they admire those athletes and more importantly we want the athletes to be able to make money and stay in their careers because so many just like myself just like the olympic program you know at home depot we started athletes have to there's a short window and i'm not talking about the lebron james or the serena williams you know that have the elite sports lots of revenue big salaries lots of podiums and an entourage i'm talking about all, all the world's niche athletes from skateboarders to surfers to you name it, you know, 58% of Olympians don't think they can financially hold on one more year wow. to compete. That's that, you know, and so uh, my co-founder and I, who she's been with me on a journey for a long time since mm -hmm. Beats, uh, we set out to change this. And so Obsesh was born and Obsesh is We've got today 130 athletes. Those athletes span action sports, 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 individual sports, several Olympians. Um, we even just, you know, brought on a new athlete. We're not even 100% sure what the sport is, but it's scooter. It's an escape culture. Huh, amazing. Um, yeah. And so we're putting those two markets together that are typically very fragmented and you know, athletes have built followers in social media, but they can't turn those followers into relationships or customers. Mm -hmm. That's what, you know, that's where my experience of, I understand how to, you know, convert people into customers. And those customers, those followers, if you will, they want to be customers. They want strategies to support the athlete. Today's social media platforms aren't built for them. And today's sports value chain it's still about the teams and leagues, but younger fans, those things expire. The athlete is who they want to connect with. And so we're, uh, we're about to go public, uh, meaning, you know, put the, right now the marketplace is uh, invite only mm -hmm. with the athletes. And beginning of next year, we've done a lot of testing and pilots and, oh my gosh, the athletes are so stoked because they get to share their skills and their legacy with fans and teach fans, like nothing more important than a surfer teaching, you know, uh, a young surfer, like best way to pop on your board or, you know, a basketball player, best, you know, how do you split the double team? Mm -hmm. And so we're democratizing athletes and giving fans access to have experiences with them real time because that's where sports is going. Yeah. They want access to their idols, you know? I would and, have taken it too. Yeah. And you guys have been on such a tear this year. You know, I've been following your progress. You've completed two accelerator programs, your most recently oh, with yeah. Stadia Ventures. So, you know, what, how has that experience helped shape the vision and the direction of where Obsession is going in the future? I think it's really uh, got us focused. It's given us great access. Um, we, we've been in two accelerators. One is, uh, out of Austin called New Chip. And that's really like a founder's first um, accelerator. So it really helps. What was wonderful, John Lynn and I, my co-founder, we've worked together a long time, but now we're working together on building a company that doesn't have this big support system, right? So that was great. And that helped us fine tune our, our messaging and where to focus and what to do. Stadia Ventures, who is um, our backer and they are the premier sports accelerator. Stadia Ventures is just innovation hub for the entire sports ecosystem. So we couldn't be like any more thrilled to spend our days figuring out how to meet the needs of the sports ecosystem and help the, everybody from the NHL to you know, the Olympics to the Paralympics, we're talking, we're already talking about LA 2028, Paris 2024. Stadia Ventures has got us really focused 
and really um, centered on what's important, what to build when, how to know, how to measure, and to make sure we've got, you know, not just the, uh, the vision, but we're also executing in the right way. And so we're bringing our skills to the table with the sports industry. And we just had demo day last Friday. It feels like I graduated with now three MBAs instead of one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's right. uh, but I'm a, I'm a learner and I'm curious. And, you know, uh, so it's been, the network is powerful. The people mm-hmm. are smart. You know, the access to be able to pick up the phone, no joke, and talk with the head of uh, athlete performance at the USOPC mm-hmm. or to talk with, you know, Heidi at, uh, CMO at NHL about the issues with hockey mm-hmm. that you can't, I can't even put a price tag on that. Yeah. You know, That's so, incredible. but I'm, I'm only two days out of both accelerators. So I uh-huh. feel like I've got like a whole new, uh, capacity. Fantastic. Know, of time. Well, it's, it's, it's awesome. so exciting. And I think what you touched on is, you know, we grew up in a world where all there was, was, you know, football, basketball, baseball, hockey, right? And I know you are a, a passionate mountain biker that no one will be surprised based on yes. your background. And I love to rock climb, right. but, you know, there's, those sports weren't accessible before, right? You, you didn't know no. how to get content. And how would you learn? Now. Exactly. Yeah, like you can't, you know, let's say I, I grew up in Chicago. If I wanted to rock climb, how was I going to learn? Yeah. I was going to have to, you know, my parents were going to have to enroll me in some kind of summer camp and that wasn't going to happen locally. Mm-hmm. And so that's our hope is that we make it accessible for every single sports fan, whether you're casual, you're, you know, trying to get into college as an athlete, you're elite or you're pro. We want every single fan to have access to the athletes that can teach them, guide them, inspire them, motivate them, and help, you know, level up their obsessions. So that's Amazing. our mission. Yeah. And get those athletes paid, you know? Fantastic. What they're worth. So, so I'm, I'm curious, have you always had a bit of an entrepreneurial streak or, you know, what, what was the thing that pushed you to say, okay, I'm, I'm passionate about this idea. Obviously, you have the background, the experience as a pro athlete. What, what kind of pushed you to say, hey, this is the time, now all the things have come together, this, you know, I want to pursue this? Yeah, I think I've always, uh, I've always been the entrepreneur inside, mm-hmm. you know, the other companies. So I've always been the one hired to innovate, to break the mold, to get us to the next level. And I think that comes from my family, um, you know, a family of Swedes. They're craftsmen, creators, builders, you know, and the right to roam, as we say. Um, and so it's always been in my nature. And I took a little bit of a backward uh, career, meaning I started out going into big companies and have over time really enjoyed just like, okay, I'm done turning the Niles. I'm done operating at, you know, this kind of big macro level really wanting to capitalize on opportunities where I see gaps and I, and I see consumers indicating they want that, but nobody's solving it. And so the one thing that's always been consistent in my life is whether it's my, you know, bosses I've worked for, you know, whether it was Arthur Blank or anybody else, if I ever brought them a problem, they were like, well, so how are you going to solve it? And so I did. And when I really started looking at this market and I thought, gosh, the creative industry has changed. We got things like Fiverr and Upwork. The marketing industry has changed. We've automated technology and given marketers like myself tools when we don't know how to code. We've done Shopify for people that want to start a store, but we haven't helped athletes have the tools, the resources, the plug and play model that they need to be able to have economic opportunities. And so I thought about it for a long time while I was CMO and it just kept bugging me. And, you know, uh, my partner said, well, if you're not going to solve it, stop talking about it. And so, (laughs) (laughs) so, yeah, (laughs) yeah, you know, when someone wakes you up at night, um, 
over and over and over. And I found myself just literally consumed by it and obsessed, yeah. which is how we got to the word obsession. Mm-hmm. Is like when an obsession kind of consumes you and you know you can make an impact and you know you can change it. And the athletes, I kept talking to them and they're like, we don't have a way to make money. It's too hard chasing brand endorsements. Mm-hmm. Sponsors, they want, you know, the LeBrons of the world. When I kept hearing that and seeing the behavior of fans like pulling away from sports, feeling less ambitious, just sitting and getting frustrated trying to find their way around YouTube, which wasn't built for quality or targeted Mm -hmm. content, I just thought, here's another giant gap. It's a that gap is an opportunity. I am going to change that so that any athlete of any generation going forward. It may not solve it 20 years from now, because hopefully there will be a model that is relevant then. But if we can use technology and we can give them the plug and play tools and we can make it easy for them to make a career and lengthen the the time, you know, or take all those college athletes with NIL becoming Mm -hmm. a, you know, ruling. Yeah. Only 1% of those will ever go pro, but mm-hmm. probably 99% of them could actually make a career with their athletic skills and talent. But today, they just don't have a platform or a place to do that. So we just set out to say, this was way before NIL, we set out to say, if we can organize both sides of the market and we can put people together, there's magic that will happen where fans and consumers will have their like, their best ambitions fulfilled because you know listen if i could have had like a one-on-one experience with michael jordan since i chased him around the stadium and through the parking lot for six years Mm -hmm. uh, i mean i would have doled out money all day long for that but that wasn't an option right and so we just want to change to meet a modern athlete and a modern consumer and you know so yes being the innovator it's always been in my blood i've learned how to execute really well because i've had the big experience the medium experience and the small experience that's right i actually love rolling up the sleeves that's great tracy your comments um struck on a a big piece of advice that i give a lot of early entrepreneurs which is you know you started off and you built this career and your network and experience over time Mm -hmm. And then you have the idea, but the first thing you do is you beat up the idea. You analyze it from every yeah, angle. Yeah. You give people's feedback. You think, you know, why should I do this? Why should I not do this? And it just keeps nagging at you to a point where you say, I have to do it, right? I am uniquely yeah. suited to, to tackle this problem. I have yeah. all the necessary you know, tools at my disposal to chase it down. Yeah. And then, yeah. you know, that's when you know in your gut that yeah. you have to do it. Yeah. I mean, it's such great advice because... You know, having a vision is one thing. Having the guts and the grit and the resilience to mm-hmm. actually do it. You know, sometimes at this stage in life, those are hard decisions to make, right? Sure. Because you're walking away from, you know, the ease and convenience mm-hmm. of bigger support systems, bigger paychecks, mm-hmm. all, all things that kind of help you. Um, but if you've got the grit and the resilience, you know, that's where, you know, the, the rubber hits the road really, because, you know, no overnight success has ever taken less than seven years, including Beats, including GoPro, including Facebook, Mm -hmm. include, you could go down the list. And so I actually was a little bit, uh, it's funny. I would sneak around only to myself. I mean, nobody really cared, but I would sneak around and I would ask people and I'd mm-hmm. be like, because I had access to some VCs, I'd be like, so, yeah. so like, who's working on helping the sports ecosystem? Yeah. I'd be like, oh, no, we're focused on, you know, the brands and the influencers. Hmm. Uh-huh. Then I would literally, you know, talk to people at Netflix, like, are you mm-hmm. focused on like, bringing more content to the table like Mm -hmm. and they'd be like oh we got our hands tied with family drama comedy blah 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 you know mystery Uh uh-huh and i flash forward to today where you know last dance is the biggest documentary of all time (laughs) totally but i like 
I wanted to make sure, you know, to your advice, I wanted to make sure I wasn't drinking my own Kool-Aid. For sure. And so yeah. you don't know what you don't know until you get into it. Mm -hmm. And then it's really about making sure you got a solution that the market wants and the market needs. Mm -hmm. Because I see a lot of people that over the years, especially at Best Buy, I saw so many startups, right? Yeah that wanted Best Buy as a customer. Mm -hmm. If, you know, we had access to the world's consumer tech data and I would sometimes sit and question like, well, it seems like a really cool widget, but like, where's, where's the case for using it? Yeah. And, you know, we're a little bit opposite. Like we know what both sides of the market want. Now we're just trying to like use technology to actually bring people and human relationships together. Mm -hmm. We're not trying to replace relationships. No. Um, and I think there's been an evolution of that. It used to be technology will solve everything. I remember when I moved to the Bay, mm -hmm. technology was like, <laughs> we don't need people, we got yeah. tech. Technology is the I religion. Mean, I heard it. No. Technology is the religion. If you mm -hmm. build it, they will come. I mm -hmm. heard that one like, you know, 10,000 times. Yep. But I think you know, what we're seeing is when technology can be used for good and it can be used to help people come together, achieve things, buy things, do things, feel like they're living through things. You know, you got a winning product and you That's should have written resilience to like go chase it, go yeah. build it and build the value. So what's coming next? If you had to make three predictions about the future of the digital media space or maybe more directly the sports and media space that you're involved in, what do you foresee? Yeah, I think, you know, uh, listen, I don't have the crystal ball, never will pretend to have it. I think we're all product of our times and where technology is at, right? And so while, you know, a couple of us, yourself included, you know, we've lived through 9-11, we've lived through the dot-com bubble. This is a totally different time and era. I think related to that, we're going to start to see more, uh, consumers moving online in new ways. That's no doubt about it. I think television, you know, it, it was already in a tough place. And it's, you know, the traditional television was already in a tough place. People are not, you know, young people are not buying cable packages or not buying satellite, you know, packages. And we're gonna see like a whole new era I feel like in an opportunity like this, some people, as the saying goes, some people are crying and some people are buying and building. There's going to be new technologies, new experiences. That's gonna be really cool on television. I think in the sports market, what's gonna be interesting is that it's been an evolution, but leagues and teams and brands kind of own the consumer's voice. Mm -hmm. um, today, 10 years into Instagram, 10 years into seeing the personality of athletes, young fans, they want the athlete. And so I think that traditional value chain that sports was built on, which is media rights, mm -hmm. property owners, you know, you squiggle around that and then out comes a little bit of money for the athletes. I think that's gonna be totally uh, rebuilt. Mm -hmm. And I hope companies like Obsesh help spur that innovation because the consumers want tailored experiences. And so I think tailored, personalized, and new ways to engage across all this technology, whether it's in your car, it's on your computer, it's on your phone, it's going to be everywhere. I don't have a crystal ball to say robots will come to life this year. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. No, well said. Um, That's great. I, I think, think a lot of those predictions are, are right on. Yeah. Yeah. And I think media has got a great, I, I think the gap that media has uh, desperately needs some really like smart, innovative people with a lot of grit to solve is attribution and analytics. Mm -hmm. It's so, I mean, if you just look at that ecosystem in the media oh, it's so landscape, vast. it's like, yeah. you know, it's so vast. You know, every stakeholder is holding back their data. There's, mm -hmm. you know, what we saw in mobile, we're now seeing in OTT and streaming TV, which is 
it's hell to try and measure anything on those things. And mm -hmm. so I hope somebody in the media landscape, I hope there's a whole new uh, set of, you know, entrepreneurs and, you know, younger AI and data where they can come up with a model that helps that analytics, helps people understand the consumer mm -hmm. and be able to get insights to do something with it. That's, that's, my hope. So that's the one fix we need. And it's starting to feel a little yeah. bit more inevitable. I mean, in the recent news, right, LinkedIn got slammed for over-reporting uh, paid media spends, right? Oh, hey, you got X number uh, of views. In reality, yeah. that was inflated. And, you know, Facebook, Google, they've yeah. all kind of taken hits for this over the yeah. years because yeah. they're the source of truth, right? They're the one you're buying from, but also they're expected to give you the reporting. Yeah. And famously, many of them have yeah. operated as closed ecosystems. They're not going to let Comscore or Nielsen in. Right. And I think ultimately, right. they're going to have their hand forced, if not by the market and you know, agencies, right. ad buyers saying, hey, we need third party yeah. visibility and you know, some, yeah. some effective checks in here, or regulators are going to come in and Congress is going to say, look, you, know, you have to be more transparent in the way that these ad buying practices are taking place to protect yeah. consumers. I think the, I think you bring up a really good point. And the one area that I'm really concerned about is the uh, ethical uh, practices around some of our internet favorites. So whether it be the social media platforms, again, they're built on a model to incent advertisers. It's mm -hmm. really not about anything else other yeah. than maximizing that. And, you know, you see the impact it's having on younger generations, especially as we come into this mode of like, wow, you can't just live by online relationships. It is, it's not different than your life. It is your life. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the lack of ethical uh, design practices and ethical data driven you know, interactions and practices around really what we call human centered design. We call it human for a reason. Mm -hmm. It's designed, you know, it should be designed with humans in mind. And I hope that something like this over the next couple of years, some of those big platforms really uh, start to be held accountable to, you know, shaping generations in a positive mm -hmm. way versus manipulating or monetizing generations in an unethical way. And I think there's a balance, um, but between the data, the media, you know, and ethical design, mm -hmm. I think we need a whole, a whole new cast of characters to help us say, okay, we've seen the good, the bad, the ugly, mm -hmm. right? Everybody's gotten caught, you know, like LinkedIn mm -hmm. over reporting. Yep. That's yep. famous for Vice for, you know, sure. that cost them. Yep. Um, you know, but how do we, we have enough information now to be smart enough to do the right thing, whether it's mm -hmm. your reporting, you know, so it'll be interesting. I have high hopes for it. Me too. Um, New standards know. of digital accountability, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, maybe s similar to advertising. We need that for, you know, design. Mm -hmm. I agree. Design principles, you know, yeah. So before I let you go, one question I love to ask everybody who comes on the show is, if you were starting a business in the digital media space today, just thinking about all the white space that's currently out there, what needs help, what needs disruption, what would you do? Gosh, I would start up Sash. Mm -hmm. I would create a real-time sports platform that connects <laughs> consumers and athletes. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, aside from that, if I kind of step outside of my own box, yeah. um, that is a really great question. I think one of the things that we need to do today is we need, you know, a group of really smart people that are designing business models that are hybrids. We've come from a world where everything is like a model, this model or that model, right? Ad model or subscription model, this or that. I think we're living in a world that's pretty fluid and consumer behavior is fluid. And so we need models, actually business models on places and platforms that uh, fit a consumer that is pretty fluid. Sometimes they want to subscribe. 
Peloton is a great example, right? Mm -hmm. It's a one model. You're going to like sign up subscription. There you go. Why mm -hmm. can't I buy something from that instructor? Why can't I, you know what I mean? And so I think that, uh, I've seen it, I've felt it, when one window shuts, which is what's happening in this pandemic, right? We got a lot of windows around us shutting. It's always an opportunity for new innovation, new things to be built, and new ideas to come to fruition. I, I say there's no better time than right now mm -hmm. to like build, innovate, and bring it to life. 100%, I love that. Well, Tracy, thank you so much. Where can people find out more about you and more about Obsesh? Absolutely, thanks. Uh, you can find out more about myself at uh, my LinkedIn, which is Tracy Benson. And you can find out more about Obsesh by going to LinkedIn Obsesh, or you can come to obsesh.com, or you can go to at Obsesh Media on Instagram. Amazing. Well, thank you. And I encourage everyone listening to check out Obsesh, bringing incredible fans and athlete experiences together, helping athletes make money so they can do what they love, right? Build a career, pursuing their passion, creating great content for the people that follow them. So thank you for sharing your story. Thanks for the amazing work that you do. And, and uh, great to see you. Absolutely. It was wonderful. And thank you, James, for having me. Thanks for tuning in. I'm James Creech, and this has been another edition of All Things Video. If you like what you hear, we hope you'll share and subscribe for new episodes. See you next time.